All right, I'm hitting live. And I think I'm live. All right. There's Welcome. Air. There's air. Oh, well, I thought there was water in it. Welcome to Vlog Thursday, episode 204, Cisco Switch, 10 gig AMA, Business Talks, and Arata. And that extra noise in the background is Steve getting ice. I don't want ice, though. Oh, well. Oh, well, it's too late now. I've, I'm getting ice. How much water room temperature? I actually put water in my cup and then have it room temperature. That is, that is a I'll fact. I'll microwave it. Melt the ice. <laughs> no, don't microwave it. I, I can, I'm fine with, all right, never mind. Just leave the ice. Good afternoon, 66 concurrent viewers, Woo and water. <laughs> and I still don't really know anything about that company Paycor other than they sent me this and people have asked me if, if they're a sponsor. I don't know, I'm just, I like their cup and I've actually gotten other cups like it, but this one is special and I just keep using it. It's my water cup. Yeah, then they want us to switch payroll to them. Pro I, I, they I sent know. Us all the, they sent us a couple promotional things. It was like what I My was guess doing. is that's what they wanted was to switch payroll. So. <laughs> uh, anyways, we're going to talk about all kinds of fun things. Stupid little modules. Um, yeah, you can't see it. I know it's probably too small. But it doesn't matter. It's I've done a video on these. It isn't actually news but I'm going to be doing a new video on some 10 gig stuff. So that is news. Uh, I didn't have time to dive deep into it, but yes, I'm using the latest version of TrueNAS and also True Command. I've been digging into setting up True Command and it's pretty neat. I, I like it. I didn't have time to dig enough to do a full video, but I thought I'd mention it. If you're not familiar with True Command, it's a way to take all your TrueNAS servers, tie them together into a command center where you can have one dashboard for your fleet of them. And it's kind of a, not really targeted at home users necessarily. It's something more targeted at someone like us who manages uh, people's free NAS and TrueNAS systems or, you know, Matter of fact, we actually support some other people, uh, movie studios. We've we've gotten a lot of new movie studio production. I like the studio themselves, but the studio is more about a series of companies that work together. So like the sound, we have more than one sound engineering company. We have a proposal for another one. Well, a meeting coming up with one. And we have um, a handful of like, editing places that remaster older movies. Uh, this is another editing team. Uh, we're working with another startup that has another movie idea. And a lot of the storage on the back end is TrueNAS and FreeNAS that is uh, common. And this uh, the TrueNAS command is gonna be kind of a way to manage all those. This is pretty cool. Uh, so fun stuff. Uh, yeah, I have a video on why I chose XCP and Geo Proxmox. It looks like Eric already threw it in there. Awesome. We got hello from AUS, UK, NC, and all over the place. And Logan, sorry to hear that your cloud backup solution is down. That is bad. Um, yeah. Uh, do you have a permanent VPN open to customers or does that... Uh, it do I have an open VPN for what? It depends what I'm doing. So what? What you're asking a question, but I don't know the context. So do I have a permanent open VPN? Not always. So uh, TrueNAS Command is a paid system. Uh, it is going, they have a couple options. One of them is gonna be like cloud hosted where IX system will host it for you. Uh, the other one is so you can download it and run it yourself. Both are paid options though. Whether they do the hosting or you do the hosting, it's not a free server. So yeah, that's just a uh, heads up on that for those of you wondering. Mm. To do what else do we have here for the true NAS? The true NAS is cool. I, I definitely like it. Now I will bring up and I'll pull this up over here. I am running the latest version of it. Um, eh, we'll pull one up here. There we go. This one. And uh, actually, I got to get something else for y'all before I switch screens. Where did that go? I feel like it's this one. Ah, oh, here we go. One second, we will start switching screens. I gotta pin some tabs. Pin. 
Switch. Well, that's not good. Here, we'll fix this. <laughs> when in doubt, you plug it in, you, you unplug it and plug it back in again, and that fixes it. Don't ask me. Watch, it'll just poof. Once in a while that happens when I boot up, if it was plugged in on boot, you, you should always have it unplugged on boot, I've learned uh, when I boot up the recording machine. Anyways, this is a True Dance Mini 3.0X Plus, and it is running the U1. I'll probably do a video tomorrow about U1. I wanted to run it for a few days to talk about it, but yeah, the latest updates have been great. I also need to do a updated backup video because they changed the way you do. It's not hard to do, but the backup restore is slightly different, and I want to make sure people are backing things up properly. And uh, I've also been digging into slowly with my long-term review of this performance testing. And I tweeted this link out. Uh, you can find it on my Twitter. I don't know if I can drop, I don't think it'll let me drop in a link inside of here, uh, but it's gonna be part of a video anyways. And without any explanation, this is not gonna be the most helpful or insightful pieces of information that is in here. Let me shrink me down a little bit. And put me up here, way up here. There we go. Oh, well, maybe way over here. How about that? There, I'm out of the way now. Um, what you're having here, though, is I broke down record sizes, 32K versus 1 meg record sizes, and then it, and I don't know why the font's so small on here, but uh, can we just view this image in another tab? Nah, I guess not. Oh, well. Um, what we're doing here is doing a series of tests, and this is going to be what I'm going to break down in some of these videos, is the question comes up of what's the best way to configure my TrueNAS system, and the answer is not that simple. And I say that because these differences are different tests run with different record count and iSCSI uh, volume sizes. And there are a variety of results in this, probably this results page here, which we can zoom into a little bit, because it is really small. It's even small for me. There we go. And one of the things it highlights is each one of these scenarios is better under different loads. So the workload will drive the configuration and the workload, as in, for example, right here, where do we get some of the really high numbers? Um, is it this one here? So sequential writing for kilobit was bad with 32K sectors, but good in one meg, I said sectors, it's 32K records versus one meg records. These are data set records. And this is gonna take a lot of explaining, so I'm not gonna spend all of my time on it here in this video, but it's gonna be kind of a deep dive on uh, how storage in ZFS works and why there's so many variations and the workload is going to be a big determining factor in how you should configure it. And there's not like a one size fits all. There is the stick it in the middle, it's good enough and probably fine for most people, but for people who have the most demanding needs, well, there's fine tuning you can do to get the most out of your TrueNAS system. So that's uh, gonna be fun. Uh, Would I still go with solar winds if I'm starting the process now? So I thought that's probably something worth uh, noting. Um, oh, and did you hear about the DOD secure network being taken down? I'm pretty sure all they did was isolate the network and cleaned up from solar winds. So this is a really complex topic and it's getting more complicated by the day. Cisco got listed as one of the companies. So, if you're trying to tell me, for example, uh, that I shouldn't use solar winds because they've been compromised, and if one piece is, all pieces are, well, so is everyone that used them, so what do you switch to? And I bring that up because we haven't got confirmation from all the other RMM companies of whether or not they were compromised. So knowing everything we know now, I wouldn't want to switch RMM companies at all. And matter of fact, I really feel uh, right now, solar winds is going through the audit of their lifetime and probably... Um, it's going to come out, you know, very well vetted, so to speak, compared to some of the other ones. Uh, but it's hard to say. I, all the RMMs suck. That's the bigger issue. There's zero people I have ever met that go, oh, I love my RMM. It just works great. That is not sentences you hear in the MSP space. Um, it is the reason there's so much debate between RMMs. For every person prior to, of course, a couple days ago and current revelations, but just historically, everyone starts with, I hate insert name of, of uh, RMM and I'm going to switch to 
next name of RMM. And then there's the debate of, oh, I just switched away from them because they're terrible. And another person goes, well, no, no, they were more terrible than the other company, but I switched to this company. And then that argue in Reddit, RMSP, and all the different Facebook groups is pretty much a daily ritual um, of people posting on it. I don't know. I don't want to go through the switching because I know they all are terrible. You dance with the devil, you know. And one person had a really honest message they sent me um, that they don't think they've ever recouped the cost. They got to bug up their butt and switch to another company. They, they told me they switched away from Solar Winds, but they feel how much money they spent switching. Uh, they don't feel as though they've recovered it yet and they're not happy with the person they switched to. And that's part of where I'm at. I don't, I don't think any of them are perfect. So I don't like, I don't even like the thought of switching because vetting them is hard. Switching is hard. Switching all your clients over, hard. Uh, training all your staff to do something new and hoping there's not an incident in between when you're in between RMMs when you're trying to figure out how things work. Um, it, it creates just a big mess. So for now, I don't, there's not enough to tell me to go away. Uh... Anyways, uh, what are the two white boxes on the table? Well, one of them, these are things I wanted to talk about. So I'll be doing a video diving into TrueNAS, et cetera, et cetera. I'll probably do a TrueNAS video just about the new update and a few other features that they've added uh, tomorrow. But the boxes, this one probably looks white. It's actually silver. And uh, as many of you know, silvers unify. So these are 10 gig switches. And we'll start here because this is a thing I wanted to talk a bit about. And that's these little devices right here. This came up and we were talking about the 10 gig hookups. Someone, and this is a really weird coincidence, man. It's almost, you ever have that thing where, and this is because people don't do coincidences very well. We have a customer that had an issue and we were looking at the fact that these only support 30 meters of cat 6A at 10 gig connectivity. So these have only a 30 meter length before they start just not working anymore. That's not the limitation of 10 gig over RJ45. If you're using CAT 6A, it will go 100 meters, but it won't go any more than 30 meters when you're doing it on a SFP module. And that's because these are low wattage. Well, F, uh, is it FFS.com happens to make, and I ordered a module that will do 80 meters. And I thought this was kind of cool that it'll do 80 meters. So we're going to be doing some testing on these. We also did verify that these will do 30, but as soon as you go over 30 meters, yeah, the, they just start dropping out and not connecting anymore. Um, they negotiate down speed and just don't work. Uh, but so we're doing a bunch of testing and it's just weird coincidence. As I said, people don't measure coincidence very well. We're not really wired for that, that in my forums, someone had asked that question too. Um, of what, where do we get some of these that are more than that meters. Now, what's interesting and the reason I have this here, we were using this for the other end of the connection. We were uh, putting more than 30 meters of cable, plugging into the 10 gig switch that's back behind me, then using the standard ports, the standard built in RG45 ports do the full length. So uh, yeah, we're just doing some playing and some testing. Uh, and so I can do a video about what works, what doesn't, and you know, solving problems kind of related to that. Cause I got some 10 gig videos coming because QNAP reached out to me and they didn't send it yet. QNAP was supposed to send me a 10 gig switch and the 10 gig switch they were supposed, I don't know where they're at with it. Uh, they said they want to send me for review and I was like, cool, why not? And that way I'll have a Unify 10 gig. I'll have a QNAP 10 gig because it's uh, supposed to be more budget oriented. I have the Mikrotik 10 gig and I'll do a video combining all of them and uh, breaking down 10 gig options for people who want to test things at home. Why not simple fiber for 80? Uh, fiber becomes more expensive when you want a computer that is more than that distance away because getting a fiber module in a computer is more of a challenge. Matter of fact, I, there's a few, my understanding there's a few laptops that have um, network in there and also running cable. It's easier to run cable than it is to run fiber. Uh, in matter of fact, go get a spool of Cat 6A and run it along somewhere in a business is easier than running fiber. Just as simple as that. So yeah. Now, uh, does this Unify switch have DC on it? Yes, I have reviewed this. This is an XG6POE, check my channel. I've already reviewed this switch. 
uh, but yes, it does have a, a DC connector on the back of it. And it is a PoE 10 gig switch with an external power brick. Yeah, we ordered the FS.com is who makes the modules that will go 80. Matter of fact, let's pull them up real quick. Uh, you know, I think I actually have them somewhere. Yep, Adam bookmarked. Right here. So if we go, um, matter of fact, this is filtered for 80. You can see that, yes, they have the 80 module right here. That's this one right here. The 80 meter transceiver module. And if you look at the other ones they have, go here, um, RJ45. The other ones are the 30 meter right here. So uh, we ordered one today and uh, it should be here in a couple days and I'll do my test and show some of the differences and talk about solutions essentially uh, for people who are running into that challenge. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Has my OBS do, uh, <laughs> gained live change since 2019 video? Nope. I think that's all the same. Uh, I can't really, I'm not the best to ask about books because I've been doing it so long. So what book to get, so, excuse me, what book to get started inside of networking? Um, not, not a best question for Tom. Uh, what do we get here? Well, the fiber stuff is cheap, but it's not as easy as when I, you know, connecting my desktop of fiber and then I'd have to run the fiber over there. It's not the modules that's the price. It's the running of the fiber that's uh, the more expensive. The modules are actually pretty cheap. I have some fiber mod. Matter of fact, you can kind of see the blue cable. That's some blue LC fiber plugged in back there. Um, I'm not doing any videos on unified dream machines. So just give up any hope. I don't, we have a unified dream machine and the only time we plug it in is to update it and confirm it still doesn't do anything useful. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. Um, we get so many people asking us cause they're constantly having uh, issues with the unified dream machine, any of the unified routing equipment. And we're just like, this is, if you need it for more than basic routing, my daughter still has a unified dream machine. Works great because she only needs to get online. It doesn't have any other needs beyond that. As soon as you go, I want VPNs and everything else, then you should probably not use that. So yeah, aqua not blue. Yes, Corey Thompson is uh, absolutely correct when he corrected me for calling it blue. <laughs> the Cisco garbage. Oh God, and I'm saying the word garbage in the, in the kindest of terms. Um, so I actually was working on these last week. Oh look, two Cisco switches. Because Cisco supports stacking. Isn't that nifty? Except it's not, it's stupid. And this is why I'm working on a video. I bought these out of my own pocket. One, cause I don't want Cisco telling me what to do. We're telling me I can't uh, complain about the stupid problems that they're, uh, products have. Um, I don't think, I don't know if you can install PFSense on it. No, P, uh, Microtik cannot be installed in PFSense because as far as I know, Microtik uses ARM chips. But here are these Cisco's. You can stack them. You can set them upside down on each other like this. Let's stack them right here. Now, one might assume because of the way Cisco does their ports. Now, these ports over here, these guys are... Uh, are uh, the ports nine and 10. I think the term Cisco uses is dual personality ports. And let me get you a closer look right here. So ports nine and 10 are the type of ports. There we go. There we go. We have some SFP and we have some copper ports right here on the end. Now you're thinking with the SFP and copper that you can use both, but you can't. They're what they refer to as dual personality. Port nine and port 10 are mirrored, so you either use SFP or you can use RJ45. So there we go. We got an SFP module in there. But here's where the fun begins. And uh, when you start stacking them, so you can have a single management interface and have them stacked together, 
I assumed I could use port 9 and 10 with the RJ45s. It turns out you can't. And I've been spending some time in the documentation trying to figure that out. Uh, it just sounds like they only work with SFP. So that's a real annoyance. And why that's a real annoyance is this module right here doesn't have the word Cisco on it. And when it doesn't have the word Cisco on it, Cisco goes, I'm not using that. But don't worry, there's a secret incantation that you can type that is undocumented in Cisco IOS that will say you can use non-Cisco SFPs. It appears to be that that incantation was removed from this particular device. Um, so there's that. So now I have to go get, and this is what delays these things, a Cisco SFP compatible module to plug into these because it only likes talking to Cisco modules. So yes, that's just fun. Um, I got I got nothing for why Cisco builds that way other than this is how they build in margin. Um, but it's, in the review of the Switch is gonna be, like the Switch by itself is fine. The stacking feature absolutely requiring Cisco only is stupid. The fact that the stacking feature requires me to use SFP and not standard RJ45 cables is stupid. Um, those are big glaring problems. The other thing I'm going to do is invite on my channel. I've got a couple friends that are good with Cisco and I'll probably invite one of them on to break down the differences between full Cisco and what this is missing on these Catalyst 1000s. So, ah, it's just silly. It's just some funny, yeah. The Cisco only stuff is just dumb. Um, yeah, there, it's just, I don't know. It, it's why the video is not done, which really annoys me because I've already reviewed, like I did a lot of the other uh, setup work. I just let me put this back over here. We can plug it in. I actually have my, um, where'd my cable go? I, there's a lot of quirkiness that I want to cover with this uh, when I do the video too. It's, it's not just the Cisco, it's all the quirkiness that comes with this Cisco that I want to cover in the video. It's a bunch of, the Cisco people are just going to nod their head going, well, of course it's like that. That's how Cisco designs things. Um, but I'm more of the lines of, it's 2020. I can't believe Cisco still designs things like that. <laughs> but maybe I'm weird. Ugh. Oh, one of the problems I have with it is it has, um, I once had it on one of my networks that has a, I had it on the phone network where it grabbed the TFTP. Now it won't stop. Uh, once it tries to find a TFTP server, it keeps finding the TFTP server. It's kind of fun. I don't understand why it does that. That's a, that's a fun feature. And by the way, write a race. Nope, that doesn't fix that. Oh, by the way, that we're gonna we're gonna cover the boot process because there's. Uh, so you guys just watched me plug it in. So now we can watch it boot. We can just keep carrying on a conversation because it's gonna be a minute. Oh, this is my favorite part of the boot. Let me move myself. This is Cisco collecting money from all those modules. Look at those dollar signs go across. That's that Cisco only module collection fee. That's the dollars right here. Let's make this a little bigger. There we go. Here we go, Cisco. And eventually we're going to get to the errors with all the TFTP BS. Cause you know, why not? Now we got to chill out right here for a minute. I don't know what it does here. Their switches. This is something, um, that annoys me a lot about Cisco. Like they just take, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna be a smart ass. I'm gonna take this Mikrotik switch right here. We're gonna plug this in and have it booted and up and running before the Cisco finishes. Uh, I can probably, let me log into the, give me a sec. Oh, look, fine. Oh, no, we're not up yet. Nope. Uh, hold on, I gotta switch so I can find the IP list of the other one, but don't worry. The Cisco's still doing its thing and it'll be, it'll be a minute. I just got I don't know the IP addresses of the Mikrotik, but don't worry, I have a list. Ah, 
There we go. I'm in. Where's my friend here? Oh, we're still booting. I booted and logged into and had to remember the IP address of the micro tick. And the Cisco's booting. <laughs> these are dumb problems, I think. I For what you pay for these switches, these are problems that I think should be solved. And this is also another issue that I gotta figure out. Like I said, it decided to keep looking for, and I don't know, I, I'm guessing it's because at one point, I, all I did was plug it in, but then reset it um, and moved it to another network. I didn't use the TFTP at all. It just found my TFTP server, and now it just sits here timing out. And the, I think the other one does it too, and the other one was never on that network, so that might be an interesting comparison. Maybe I'll plug the other one in um, to see if it does the same thing. But Cisco's take a long time to boot. And I think this is just, I don't know, to me, unacceptable in 2020. Maybe I'm weird. There's some Cisco fanboy can tell me uh, how wrong I am. Let me see if there's one of them in the comments yet. Let's see. Uh... Uh, let's see. I might get some more Mikrotik switches for my budget uh, video as well. So, um, dollar dollar bill, yo, yeah. Oh, that's why you want to get Cisco certified so you can deal with long boot times. Uh, yeah, I know the Cisco's of fans. They do that whole. Yes. I know, it's the, the fans, and they just go into full full burn mode, man. They sound like they're going to take off. Oh, good. We're finally booted over here in Cisco. We're, we've long since logged into... Hell, I could have done a firmware update and rebooted my... Uh, insert name of any other switch on the table here. The Unifies, the Edge, the uh, Microtech, while we wait for the Cisco to um, fail and garbage its way through a TFTP failure. But hey, we're at a prompt now. Anyone know how to turn off TFTP in Cisco real quick? I don't remember the command. We can log into the web interface though. Oh, let's see. Let's actually, while I'm here, let, uh, I I can't remember the IP address. I think I know what it is. I'll show you this Cisco web interface. Oh, good. I did. I did remember that one. I didn't have to go back to my list. Here we are at the Cisco web interface, which is also painfully slow, by the way. I mean, I'll get Mikrotik might be painfully ugly, but it's not painfully slow. <laughs> it's they at least are they're ugly, and we're still spinning. Here we go. All right, and don't worry, making changes is even more fun. Wow, look at this. I do know, I haven't messed with the HDAC, but the HDAC only supports SFP, so this is that HDAC. Right now it's set to non-configured. It's supposed to just work, um, but it doesn't. Actually, let's go back over to monitoring, look at the ports, and uh, I could plug in a non-Cisco device and it's just gonna break. And I have this set to all with the upload, so I do have this set to the trunk port, but it's still yeah, it doesn't, it works. It just doesn't do the stacking like it's supposed to. Um, and it's full, it's gonna give a bunch of TFTP errors in the alerts that are gonna come up. And I don't know, I'm just not that impressed with this as a switch. I, I think they're reliable. I will give them that. The Cisco makes a device that I can leave plugged in for a long time. And I had tweeted my other problem I have with Cisco. I wanted to, I bought this product, but I, there's a new firmware. I'd like to load the new firmware, but apparently, and let's go to Tom's Twitter now, because this happened in Twitter. I, well, I tweeted it at least. I can't sign up for an account until I go through a compliance review. Until you go, then they can activate my Cisco account so I can download firmware. This is what I get from them um, is, I, yeah, we're sorry. Until you authenticate from our compliance review center, we can't let you download firmware. Well, good thing there's not a zero day on patching or something because, well, that would be annoying. Other people offered to download the file for me. I know there's workarounds. I've just... Pointing out the silliness 
of Cisco sometimes here in 2020. Uh, no boot network and no service config than WR. Okay. Oh, I I'm going to tag network truck. I don't think he'll even reply to me on this. He did a video on these, but he didn't cover anything. And uh, yes, no service config, no boot network and no service config. And then WR. So just go into the admin and do that. Okay. Well, you can try that. We're, we're going to have you guys in real time teaching Tom Cisco. I am, I used to do more of this. I think someone said no service config. Was that right? So no service config. All right. Wait, I did something wrong. Don't I got to type conf T? Yes. No. E-N-D. Is it W-R? And that should fix it, right? No service config, exit, write mem. Conf T. Okay, I was, we got it then. Conf T. Awesome. So uh, do I have to reboot it, or is that enough? That's the next question. We should just do a teach Tom Cisco. We'll have you guys teach Tom Cisco. <laughs> that seems like a fun thing. So the other question I'm going to have here, and let me find the commands and make some notes here. So I like that that worked. That made me happy. And it was no service. I, I make notes. The way I don't have to do this. I'll probably have to do this on the other one. So that's my important part here. I'm looking at what you guys wrote so I can start creating new notes for all these things. Where'd that go? Uh, yeah, conf t first. Look at the config, conf t. Yeah, no service config. Perfect. Control C. All right. Here, I'll show you what I'm doing here. Creating notes. It's all important notes. Now, who can help me with this one? This is the one service unsupported transceiver. I can't find, I, I, everyone tells me that should work, but it's not working. So what am I doing wrong with the uh, service unsupported dash transceiver? Um, that's supposed to be the, the magic incantation to allow non Cisco transceivers. So I await now for that answer because <laughs> no one on Twitter knew. Uh, tab completion also won't, won't do the, um, this one. The reason tab completion won't do it is, uh, what do you call it? The, um, it's an undocumented command. So unfortunately it won't work, which is really annoying. Actually, let me move these over to my work file. So delete these, all right. Um, all right, cool. And I can share this again. Just had to delete a few things out of here. Notes and notes and notes. Um, yeah, no one has a suggestion for that other one, do they? The no, uh, no error disabled detect cause, GBIC invalid. Oh, okay. Yeah, I ordered, I've got some stuff with a uh, Cisco tag coming. That's the, pro well, the other stupid problem is um, these are only uh, one gig, not 10 gig. So finding uh, ones that are 10 gig is all you find. I should say finding one gig ones are hard. So 
Uh, did you do comp T for the for the service command? Yes. Let's let's go through that together. So uh, conf T. All right, we're in the config. And I'll copy pasta the command because I want the command to be accurate. And it's service unsupported uh, dash transceiver. Everyone says that's the right command. And that's the message I get. I, this is why I posted on Twitter and no one replied. Well, people replied that I should type the command. I, I thought that was funny. I'm like, well, I, I took a screenshot of what it's doing and showing I typed that command. Um, I think I spelled N S U P P O R T E D dash transceiver. I found a lot of other people with this problem, but without solution to it, other than some people saying it's not available in some Cisco equipment. They removed it. I don't know if that's true um, because it's an undocumented command. It's not in Cisco at all. Uh, fun to see live log with terminal monitor. You can turn it off with terminal no monitor. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, that command is deprecated in newer versions of iOS. I found people saying that. SH interface transceiver. So I should end this. All right, it's dumping everything. I typed the wrong command, I'm sure. Can you control C this? What stops this? Okay, there we go. SH interface, what'd you say to say? <laughs> uh, service question mark will not show you the transceiver command because it's not documented from them. That much I do know. Q, all right, Q stops it, cool. Uh, SH interface transceiver. All right. Copy and paste because that's way better than Tom typing because I'm bad at typing sometimes. Today is definitely that sometime. So you're telling me to type SH interface transceiver. All right. Make sure I got it right. Go to the terminal. Diagnostic monitoring not implemented. So that didn't get me any further, did it? Good luck, Grayson, in learning Cisco. You have a lot to learn. Get ready for a lot of command line. Oh, that's actually the problem um, I see you're, you're pointing at, uh, Nikolai, Nikolai, is this is only a one gig interface. So, y yes. It, this is a, not a, I see you have the word 10 gig in there and I, that's something else's might be part of the problem. They only put one gig SFPs on here, not SFP plus. So it's, it's only creating more confusion dealing with it. And these are the kind of hangups like any other switch I'd have it configured. Even MakerTick, as much as I complain about not liking some of their interface stuff, I think they may have a better interface than some of the Cisco stuff. Now, the logic for their routing is a different topic altogether. I'm talking about MakerTick Switch OS. I, I kind of like the Switch OS. It actually is relatively easy to configure. Um, but the other stuff is kind of, yeah. Uh, SHIP interface BR to see interface names, all right. SH, uh, you say IP interface. There we go. Huh. Well, here's what's kind of interesting about that is it doesn't show, it shows nine and 10, but they're the, am I using, is dual personality, isn't that the, the term Cisco uses for these um, dual personality ports? Because the, uh, 910 are both RJ45 and SFP. They're either or, but not both. 
<sighs> oh, fun times. Config A and see if it appears. Show interface. I think I'd have to, I mean, it's got a lot here. So it's, well, not a lot. I mean, it's a, there's 10 ports. So let's jump down to the last one. Zero, six, seven, eight, nine. There we go. And 10. Let's look at the last one here. Yeah, zero, 010 line protocol is down, not connect. So 10 or five minute. I don't see nothing really in here tells me much about it. So there's everything about the port 10. Everything that's uh, about it flow control, auto select, uh, media type is not present. Um, I can always roll and stick in a unify one real quick. Here we go. Got a unify one. Let's uh, stick it in port 10. All right. Uh, Transceiver inserted, transceiver has been inserted. So, invalid detected on uh, G110, putting G110 in error disabled state. So that's, that's what we get when we put that in there. Run no error disabled state, GB10 invalid. Okay, we can try that command. No error state GBC invalid. Whoops, let me put a D at the end. So, oh, SO conf T, then that command. Fair enough. Are we gonna have this thing completely borked by the time we're done? Probably. So conf t didn't work. All right. And now we'll try that command. I think I'm in the right spot. All right, and it's probably a WR, right? No. End. WR. Configured by console. All right, anything else I have to do? Oh, okay. Got it. Two different commands, which I did. So that's awesome. I'm getting smarter. <laughs> Unplug, replug, and it should work. Well, let's find out. Did these magic incantations do the job? Transceiver has been removed. Put it back in. Still has bad CRC. Now, don't worry, I tested this. I plugged it right into more than one switch. It works right away. So it's it's only here. I've tested this twice in actually two different switches and I haven't had any problems with it. It just doesn't like the Cisco switch. Um, I mean, I, and I even have other, I think I tried one other module on it, but it just doesn't like it. But this module is working perfectly fine with other switches I plugged into it. So we're still back at square zero 
And these are actually, I think I probably ran through at least a few of these guesses before. Um, oh, shut and no shut. How about I just reboot it? Let's just try rebooting it. So we'll go ahead and unplug it. Unplug it and uh, we'll just reload the switch here. Eh, set that. I don't want it dingling. Reload. Confirm. We'll let this thing do its boot process again. And now that we would got rid of the um, FTP, let's hope it's faster on booting now because that's what we get stuck on is the FTP thing. <laughs> the system will auto boot in five seconds. And here comes those dollar signs. Dollar dollar bill. Oh, fun stuff. All right, that's booting. I'll answer some questions while it boots. Yes, it is a non-Cisco. That's that's the problem. We're trying to get it to accept non-Cisco. I don't think it does. I think it's just... Um, yeah, I did buy one. I just didn't have one handy. But these are some of those annoyances with Cisco, in my opinion, when you have to do this. It's just... It's one of the reasons, like, I there's... Oh, yeah. I didn't do a copy run start. Whoops. So that's a whole different problem. So we probably lost all the things I did. <laughs> I think this is enough Cisco. I could probably spend all day playing with it. I'm going to let my friend come over and poke at it because he that's, he's, that's all he does is Cisco. So he's really good at it. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why people like Cisco so much is they spent so many years doing it and they're so upset when I'm able to plug a switch in and it works and I can configure and build it out in seconds. And they're like, but, 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 but my Cisco, I, I have all this um, esoteric knowledge of dealing with all the crazy and quirks. Like they have to justify the thousands of hours they've spent doing it and thinking it's the only way it can be done. Um, that's where I think a lot of the problem comes in with Cisco. Like the, the sunken cost uh, of it all where... People are like, but I have to do it like this because I've always done it this way. And there's, it's, it feels unfair for other people to have it easier than me. I think that's like some of the problems with some of the Cisco, the Cisco people is they can just be that way. I don't know. And I won't lie. I mean, yeah, there's the ears. I don't care. I'm not going to mess with these ears. I did order the Cisco stuff. It's just not here now um, is part of the problem. It, until it's here, um, I can't finish my review. I can actually finish my review. I can review the switch. I just can't add that extra review for the Cisco part of the switch uh, where you do the stacking. And I know that's a question a lot of people have is how does it stack up? And uh, it, it doesn't unless you got a bunch of Cisco stuff. That's that's the answer on that one there. Oh, fun times, fun times. Uh, the age old problem, nobody gets fired for buying Cisco. I don't know about that. Um... Yeah, I see someone else suggesting service on ported transceiver. It doesn't appear to be supported on this device. We can't get that to work. Everyone keeps telling me it works, but we I've tried it everywhere and it doesn't work. Too much fun with Cisco. Yes. Yep, copy, run, start, copy, config. But I don't know. I'm done playing with that for now. You can see how much fun Cisco is. And I mean... There's a lot of them in the market, but one of the things we've talked to, some of the large suppliers, hardware vendors and VARs as they call them, and the um, one of the things they've told us is they, they don't like getting into Ubiquity because um, they know Ubiquity doesn't have a lot of support. They also know that the margins are worse on Ubiquity than they are on selling Cisco, but they have to sell them because the demand is absolutely astounding to them. There's a reason Ubiquity is a company that has a market cap of well north of $10 billion right now. They're selling a lot of hardware because people are so aggravated dealing with things like this. They just want stuff up and running and working. And uh, yeah, so it's just one of those things. The same with Microtik. I understand the popularity um, of the Switch. I don't get the router OS as much, but the Switch OS is pretty basic. And for people go, you know, I need a 10 gig switch up and running. 
please note how fast I got this Mikrotik up and running. Uh, I pulled it out of the box, plugged it in, and logged into the web interface faster than the Cisco even boots. Uh, that's just things. Or in like the firmware updates, I had to go register for an account that is still not approved that I registered for this morning to get a firmware update. It's 2020, give away the firmware. Like, I, it's not like I'm using the firmware for anything bad, and it's not like I couldn't have found the firmware pirated somewhere, so I, I don't know. But the um, Mikrotik, I, like I said, I don't love them, and people want me to do more things with them. Uh, but as bad as I thought this web interface is, the more you work with the Cisco one and how slow it is, you're like, yeah, never mind. The Cisco is kind of a pain. Um, and it's not that everything needs to have a web interface. I'm clearly a command line person. I use a lot of Linux. I, I just like really solid, good documentation that's consistent. And that's not something you seem to get out of Cisco. Uh, even if you go through Cisco training, the Cisco people, the debate that just happened right here, and even though I've talked to two different Cisco people, they told me there's more than one way to do it. And Cisco has undocumented features for this. So you can see my rant um, and someone's gonna tell me I'm wrong, but whatever, it, it's still a problem. Um, what was I looking for in here? Is it stats? There was something I wanted to see in here. Errors, VLAN, link. Oh, probably these. Um, this is, this is nice because it will, matter of fact, this will probably work fine if I did this other than create a loop. So come on, spanning tree. Hey, look, it worked. It recognizes it's a UBNT, mode fiber, magic. You know, that's a pretty simple way to do it. It worked right away and linked. It doesn't have a problem. I got a link light. Um, I do have a spanning tree here, but that's because it, I just created a loop. But that's, I know I created a loop, but it didn't, it, it's actually passing traffic. That's why that works. So that's uh, for all those wondering and, uh, follow-up for the end of this video essentially is yes I did try it in another device and look it linked and worked <laughs> so there's that let's go back down here there we go this can go over here and I'll answer a few more questions before I wander off I do have some stuff to do today um, here we are all right any final questions for the good of the class I do have a few extra things unfortunately I have to do um, yes, the Mikrotik switches, I'm looking at a couple of them. Um, I just want to do some more videos and breaking them down. We might use some of them, but I will tell you, this has become a huge, um, success story. This little one with the four 10 gig ports, uh, for people building home labs, hands down. If you need 10 gigs, um, connectivity on a budget, I can't even suggest a competitor that's uh, in that same price category. So that is, it's an impressive little switch. And then you go up a little bit like Corey Thompson here is saying for the $500, you get the, let's look up what model that is. Why not the model, which uh, exact one that is. Uh, uh, yeah, copy paste is not always happy. Pull up the micro tick here. This is a $500 switch that can do the 40 gig QS50 plus. I mean, you, for 500 bucks. Uh, Serve the Home has actually uh, done some really good detail work on these micro tick switches. Now they say the same things I do. The routing is not that impressive with them, but the raw switching with them is. For switching VLANs and the basics, they got it figured out. Like you, in they run. You get a model that runs Switch OS, like this one right here, runs router or Switch OS. I usually put them in Switch OS. It's a little bit more basic, but if you just need to configure some VLANs and some basic stuff, and for the price, being able to get a 40 gig switch that's in that $500 price range, and then you're going, well, it doesn't have the dual redundant power supplies uh, or some of the other features you might be looking for. Matter of fact, does this one? There's a couple of them that did. And then someone then complained that they weren't hot swappable. And I'm like, really? You're gonna complain about this 
because if you look at other models by Aruba, by Ruckus, by Cisco that have 40 gigs, you can buy four of these devices for what you'll pay for one of those. So that's definitely an interesting um, of note type thing with the way these micro ticks work. They're, they're price budget friendly, even though they may not have certain features you like, like the you know data center level hot swap power supplies, but buy two of them, set them up in a failover situation, and they're cheap enough to keep another one on the shelf, copy the config file out of one, push it to the other one so you have a backup of the config and a hot ready switch uh, in there if you didn't want to do the HA config. I mean, there's some, there's some solid solutions that are budget friendly, um, and the reliability seems to be decent. The, the problems that people seem to have with the MakerTik come down to weird, more extensive routing. I've had people tell me it's Latvian logic, which is kind of not the right answer, where, yeah, it does some weird things, but for VLANs and your standard, a lot of standard config that people use, I think it's still, it, it's probably a good buy for that and a good fit for that, good use case. Uh, 40 gig and here I'm thinking that my second hand Aruba with uh, 10 gig is a baller. Yeah, that's, it's finally they're starting to kill. So I mean, the, the used market is so where you can find a lot of really cheap stuff, but yeah. Um, uh, so 50,000 plus PFSense, that's where you start getting into the TNSR uh, system that PFSense, someone says, do you have any any ones with 50,000 users on it? We've done some data center work, but when you, it's, it gets a lot more complicated when you have a 50,000 user environment because you're probably looking at something different than uh, PFSense. In matter of fact, your routing and your filtering usually become separate devices. So um, it's a more complex network setup. It's not you can just drop in um, a PF sense automatically, there's a lot of bandwidth to consider. And this is where, once you start getting into people with 10 gig fiber lines, um, this is why they started making things like the uh, TensorFlow system over at NetGate. So they're, 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 that becomes a different topic that goes on a different scale. Um, I, I can tell you, I don't have any PF senses installed with 50,000 plus users behind it. Not at the moment. We've done some big companies with it, but I don't think 50,000 people behind it. Um, now, WISP and MikroTik go hand in hand for a good reason there. And what I've learned from talking to people in the WISP market is the margins are none. Like the margin is very, very small. You don't make a lot of money in that market. So you can't afford anything else. But to the other side of that, people I know that I've talked to in the WISP market um, usually live in very rural areas. And it's that whole problem of I'm time rich and cash poor. So they really put the time in learning the micro tech. They really, I mean, dig deep into it. And they're uh, probably your most active community users of micro tech. So they've really put the time in to learn it because the other option was I, nothing. You know what I mean? So they're sitting in a rural area, they've dug deep into it, they've figured out the quirkiness of it and know how to make it work, and they've built out WISP units with MikroTik. And because of its price, it fits the budget, especially the non-recurring license pricing. It is a good budget fit for managing some of the WISP stuff. Um, it, it's I get it while it's in that market. It's kind of like the shoe fits really well, they set thing up. Um, yeah, I mean, the CCNA is probably good for learning some of the network stuff. There's also a lack of, there's a lack of Cisco certified techs. Well, yeah, it's expensive. Um, the time, the training, the test, accessibility, um, that those are all, and this, once you get outside the U.S., that, that problem persists again, where the use of Cisco starts falling off for the same reasons. Uh, the U.S. dollar, if it's running strong, makes it really expensive for people to buy Cisco gear with all the license fees and everything else, too. So, yeah, definitely. Um, 
Anything else? I think I covered all the things I wanted to talk about. I've talked about 10 gig. I talked about Cisco. I talked a little bit about TrueNAS just to bring it up and mention it that I'll be doing. I'll be doing a video on it that's dedicated anyways because um, I haven't done one in a little while. Um, I can't think of anything else right off the top of my head. Um, the other, oh, uh, I tweeted about it. I'm still working on Security Onion. I thought it was kind of fun and I'll bring this up right here. I think I had a screenshot again. And the screenshot, it says, where'd it go? Here you go. This is uh, the security onion running at my house. I've been running, I run it here too, but I'm going to use my house because I don't care about seeing all the IP addresses and where all the traffic goes. Uh, but seven days, this is seven days of logs right here. 9.4 million security onion logs to parse through. And uh, it's going to be, I want to dive into the complexities and I, and it's funny, I've been working on this for a while and then the solar winds thing came out, but it relates directly to it because people say, why didn't they just see the traffic? And when you talk about me, Tom, at my house, having 9.4 million logs, I'm trying to, I might be, I can get a quote from one of my friends who's a, works at a very large company with a massive, massive amount of endpoints. And uh, he runs a security team. I'm gonna say, so uh, how many logs a day or per second do you get? Like how many connections are you guys monitoring? Cause they actually have a full monitoring stack. And uh, the number is so staggering. You ask how do they miss it? You're like, how do you find it? And someone says, well, you should whitelist the internet. Clearly anyone who tells me to whitelist only a approved list of IPs, uh, clearly has never tried to manage a company with that many people. Um, it's just not, it's not a realistic goal. Uh, the internet is too diverse, too changing and maintaining those IPs is very difficult. Um, that's what led to all this. And someone will tell me I'm wrong and I'm fine with that. Like I said, it, from the armchair, uh, it, it's, it's easy from, I know people working in the field and I have friends who work in this. Um, matter of fact, Xavier, we were messaging and talking just before the beginning of this and it, it, he is unbelievably busy with all these things. So, <laughs> uh, what else do we have? Yeah, so the SIM stack, your SIM filling up 12, uh, 10 terabytes per day. That sounds about right. That is just crazy. Mm. I've never, I don't know. I can't, I don't know anything about the UBNT certification program. I've never done it, so I just can't answer that. Um... Yeah, they, they like, it never gets attacked, but the reality is you can't get attacked if you're not logging it, right? The attack didn't happen if I don't have a log of it. <laughs> so it is, yeah, it is a real, real challenge. Everything needs to be online. Everything connects somewhere and monitoring all of it's really, really difficult. Um, get whatever Cisco certifications you want. I, I, I'm not a Cisco expert guy. I am absolutely the furthest from it. If you watched the beginning of this video, you'd hear me just ranting about the things I don't like about Cisco, but it is my anniversary and I'm going to go hang out with my wife. Um, we've been married a long time. So thank you everyone who joined. Um, and now it's time to wander off. Uh, Let's see. Oh, happy. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the happy anniversary wishes. So later and have fun. See you guys next week. Uh, comments, Twitter. I'm fine. People want to tweet at me. Don't try to send me a bunch of DMs. And uh, also uh, forums, forums.lawrencesystems.com. I'm there quite a bit talking to people and uh, having a good time. Thanks.